my name is Terry Baum, T E R R Y B A U M. Okay, and please tell me your birthday. November, and where I was born? Where? November 27th, 1946, in Los Angeles. Okay. <clears throat> so tell me a little about the family that you were born into. Who were they? What were their values? What was kind of like the culture of your family? Well, it was middle class, Los okay. Angeles One Jewish. Try to take my question into your answer. So okay, yeah, 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 I got you it. Know the right, right. Um, my family was very much part of the middle class or upper middle class Jewish Los Angeles community, which meant that you, part of that was you had subscriptions to all the major cultural institutions. You just did. I mean, it wasn't like my parents and all their friends loved theater. Some of them did, but it didn't matter. If you were Jewish, you had to have a subscription to the Mark Taper and the Amundsen. So there was, um, I would say it, it was always not rich, but very comfortable. Uh, I I had a younger sister, three years younger. She she died um, in two thousand nine. So, but and my everybody's gone. I'm an orphan. Um, there was a, was a relatively tranquil, easy childhood. Uh, I would say very little. I it was assumed that I would always be a good girl and get good grades, but very little was expected of me other than that. And uh, I think because I was a girl, it was kind of didn't matter. I asked, in, <clears throat> when I was much older, I asked my father, I said, uh, were you aware that I was special in any way. And he said, well, I was aware you were above average in intelligence. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's how I remember it too. <laughs> but despite that, I had a very close relationship with my father. I adored him. We're kind of the exact same person, except a uh, different gender and different generation. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my mother, I th was a very uh, loving, satisfied housewife, you know, uh, wanted to be a housewife and a mother, I think was a very good mother, but became progressively more and more disenchanted with me as I came into myself after I graduated high school and went away. Uh, so... She wanted you, your mother... Um wanted you to maybe <clears throat> follow in her footsteps? She wanted my, me to marry. I remember this was before I came out because she said, would you marry a lawyer, you know, if you then had to give up your theater work and, you know, uh, and and have a family and all that. So I said, no. Would you marry a... <laughs> She had this, would you marry a CPA? Would you marry a doctor? She was trying to find somebody who I'd be willing to give up my theater for, you know. And I, for some reason, I never wanted to get married. I nobody told me. This is my feeling about it: that I didn't get the. I was not very good at getting the unspoken messages. So there's an unspoken message that. You're a girl, you're supposed to grow up and get married and have children. But nobody actually told me that. I mean, many people are told that. This is what's going to happen to you. But my parents never did. And so it wasn't very deep in me, this, this feeling that I was going towards this path, this conventional path. I didn't know what I was going towards. I assumed I'd be a teacher because that's what smart girls did. Uh, I was always good at school. I always loved school. And I, in junior high school, I wrote plays. Uh, I wrote musicals. And I was the person, I was the go-to person if you needed a skit for an assembly. But then when I got to high school, I realized, 
oh, girls are not supposed to be that creative. And I just stopped doing any playwriting at all. And Wait, was, how, did you, how did you realize that? Like, what, what, what? Okay, that unspoken message was so powerful and so constant that I got it. Um, <clears throat> I remember, was this in high school or junior high school? It was the first, it might have been junior high school, the first serious science class that I had. Um, and it was the science class for the smart kids. But it was general science. But you got extra credit for doing experiments at home. So I loved this idea of experiments. And I was, you know, putting seedlings in the closet and seedlings in the window and recording every day. <laughs> You know, uh, seedlings in every room in the house and recording every day how they were progressing. And I went, did one experiment after another. So, um, and then your grade was determined by there was a total number of points, like you needed 1500 points to get an A or whatever, and you got extra points for your experiments. So I had far more points than anybody else in the class, which I thought was pretty cool. And nobody said anything about it. The teacher, the other students, my parents, and I understood. I did not have to be told that. That that was because I was a girl and this was science. And it was extremely embarrassing for me to be better than everybody else in the class. Wow. Yeah. I got that very clearly. I never got a good grade in science again. Never. I never was interested in it. Huh. That's crazy. So that happened. That silence. In other words, they didn't have to It silence. was silent. No, it was just silence. But what I had done, that that's the message I got. That's that unspoken message I got from that silence. That this was not okay. And I also knew somehow I knew that it was also not okay to write plays, you know. But I, I had absolutely no feeling. I had all these close girlfriends. I had no feeling. I was a late bloomer sexually, I would say. I didn't have a lot of sexual feeling when I was young, really. So you, um, <clears throat> you went up to college. You told Bill about, about going to Annie. And you, um, I, we're going to have to obviously skip some sections and go, yeah. on, you know, keep moving forward. So you go to Santa Barbara to get a master's degree, and I, I think pretty soon after that, you moved to San Francisco. Yeah, is that right? So like, I moved to the Bay Area. I moved to Berkeley actually. Okay. So I me, moved to Berkeley. Me for one second. Okay. Just kind of give me a little bit of like a I went to college. I got okay. A master's degree in Santa yeah, Barbara. yeah, yeah. Um, I went. So I. Uh, <clears throat> I knew as a as a kid in LA, you know you're supposed to go to a UC, but I knew from being in a very large high school that I wanted to go to a small college. And uh, of course I wanted to go to Stanford because that's where my father wanted me to go, you know, but I didn't get in. Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, and so um, other than that, I wanted to go to a small college and I, went to Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. The reason I chose it was because my father thought it was more down to earth than Reed College because it had a, a work program. You alternated uh, some quarters of working on campus and going somewhere in the United States and working a job. Three months study, three months somewhere working, come back. And uh, <clears throat> so Antioch, it took five years to graduate from Antioch. I think it was very good for me. And one of the great things was I saw, even though I thought I was going to be a social worker, that I really didn't fit in with the other social workers. And in fact, the only place I, I didn't fit in anywhere, except finally I had a job as an apprentice at the Studio Arena Theater. And finally I fit in. And it, I already loved theater and loved doing theater, but I, un, I understood that it was an extremely unrealistic 
impractical thing to do. But then it just appeared that really didn't fit anywhere else. So I graduated in 1969 and I started, uh, I went to New York to uh, be in an MFA program in directing in Columbia. I didn't like it so much. I have to say uh, it just wasn't up to snuff compared to Antioch. The, they, that graduate program actually expired and now they have another one that is very, very successful. So I quit and I did theater in New York for three years, directing. I became a, a director. I, I became a director because basically I never got cast as an actor. So it seemed like, all right, let's try something else. How about instead of waiting for people to choose me, I have the power and I choose people. And then, um, so I was in uh, New York doing theater. And I became a feminist at that time. I was, you know, joy that was what was happening for the first time it was very exciting. I was like the first feminist on my block. So everybody would bring their boyfriends to me. <laughs> I was still straight, but everybody would, you know, wanted their uh me to talk to their boyfriends about feminism, you know. And uh I remember that. I really enjoyed doing that, you know. And uh, once I became a feminist, there wasn't anything I wanted to direct because I was very familiar with the dramatic canon. This was like 1969, 1970. All the feminist plays that had been written since then didn't exi exist yet. And um, so that's when I started writing or working with other people to create new work. And I went to... <clears throat> And then I went to graduate school at UC Santa Barbara with an emphasis in directing. And I went there because I wanted to start a community theater. And I, that's how I chose UC Santa Barbara. And I decided it would be a good place for a, a community theater. And that's what I did. So I was getting my degree, but my main focus was uh, working in this community theater that I started. And we started writing our own stuff. Now, was that a specifically, uh, was it uh, feminist in its orientation? It was not feminist. We had a feminist theater within it. We had an Isla Vista feminist theater. Okay, well, back up a little bit, say, so um, just so we have kind of like a clean thought. Yeah. Um, so I started this theater company, and within it... Yeah, oh, right. I started the Isla Vista Community Theater, and within the Isla Vista Community Theater, we had a feminist theater. Now, this feminist theater had men in it. We were, we had no concept of just women, uh, and I mean, and the men were committed to doing feminist things, and we wrote our own material based on our experiences. And so, one of the first uh, scenes that I wrote. It was inspired by a Jules Pfeiffer cartoon, which was like my experience, which was um, <clears throat> a man saying uh, the man and woman are sitting facing each other. They're having a conversation. And, and the man saying, me, 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 goes on panel after panel, me, me, me. And finally, the woman says very timidly, I and the man yawns with boredom. <laughs> so I wrote a scene, I think that was the first thing I ever wrote, that started with that cartoon, and then the woman talking to the man about the fact that he never listened to her, and she always listened to him. So. That's really, really cool. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So, um, what did it mean just out from my outline English? What did it mean to start a community theater? What did that what, what is it? What was a community theater? Like when you say I started a community theater, Isla Vista. Well, Isla Vista was not a regular town, it was a college town. There wasn't really it UC Santa Barbara is in Isla Vista, it's not in Santa Barbara. Isla Vista's on the beach. So almost everything in the town was uh, about the university or people who had been in the university and never moved away, or surfers. <laughs> um, 
So I just, I didn't even know what a community theater was, but I put an ad in the school paper, which was the only paper in Isla Vista, saying that we everybody who was interested in starting a community theater come to uh, this one place for a meeting. Okay. Yeah. So it was basically a theater company based in the town. Yes. To That's right. Okay. Yeah. That was pretty simple. I just had to. Yeah. Okay. So, and what did it mean that it was, you had this, like when you say you had a feminist kind of group or theater within the community theater, just enlighten me as to what it meant to be a feminist theater. Well, it was not really deep because we had men in it. So there was no real sisterhood because the men were included. So it was really uh, very different from when I started uh, Lilith Theater, which was all women. There was a much an opportunity to go much deeper. There was greater safety. So I would say... I would say we kind of stayed on the surface, really. But we did things about these issues, and um, and we performed them for the community. And I think we also performed for the schools, you know, like junior high and high schools. And so it was not, it was something, but it was not the real thing. Now, at this point, in terms of your own sexual development and coming up uh, your awareness of who you were interested in, who you weren't interested in sexually, and all that, where were you at? And, and set up the time. Like, so, right. I so know. I was, I had had a boyfriend. Let's see, in college, I'd had a boyfriend uh, that I uh, lived with for often, when we were in the same place, off and on for three years. And uh, then I had another boyfriend that I lived with for a year and a half. And, and then uh, when I was at, okay, you see, so, so that's, I and I had slept with a lot, everybody slept with a lot of people. You know, that's how it was. There was, it was the beginning of my entering into college was the beginning of, of birth control pills, you know? So it was sort of, everybody was, and I was at Antioch College, so it was just very normal to, you know, have sex. And I, I would say that I, I would say I had fantasies about women. I was always close to women, but I never, ever had any real thought. I remember my, my best friend, when I was, uh, started Antioch College, uh, <clears throat> I was, you know, they put you together with somebody you don't know for your roommate, you know, and it turned out we're still very close. And uh, so uh, we just really hit it off. And of course, the great problem in our life was boys and how uncooperative they were, because basically the boys just wanted to have sex and were willing to hold out the prospect of a relationship to get sex. And the girls wanted have a relationship and we're willing to hold out the prospect of sex. So it was a very good relationship between men and women at Antioch. So and I used to sit on the edge of the bed and say, wouldn't it be great if I, Terry, was a boy? <laughs> I, now, why it never occurred to us the possibility that could be a boy and I could be the girl? Never did. But yeah, we talk about it, it'd be so wonderful and all our problems, our lives would be so happy. And in fact, years later, because I didn't come out until I was 30, years later when I told that I was a lesbian, she said it made her jealous. And she remembered those conversations that we used to have. So we both had some kind of openness to it, but it was just totally hidden. At that point, really, what a shame, because it was so much more fun to be a lesbian than a straight woman. I wish I'd done it sooner. <laughs> That's, I love that story, but what, why did it, make her, it made her jealous that you were a lesbian? Yeah, that I was a lesbian and was with someone, another woman. And then when she, this is great, 
that she she was married. Did you ever say my college roommate? Yeah, my college roommate. She got married in college. And then they got divorced, and then she got married again, and they got divorced. And then when she was in her late 60s, or maybe middle 60s, she got married again. So, and this, she was living in um, <clears throat> Gettysburg, which where she, she and her husband still are. So I, I went to this wedding, okay, and I got there a couple of days early to help prepare or whatever. And I had this dream um the night before the wedding <laughs> which was that i was at the wedding and so the uh minister was saying to uh do you accept this man as your husband and blah 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 and then uh and then he said to the groom and do you accept this woman and this uh and this the groom said well, I guess she's all right. I don't think I can do any better, really. So I better settle for her. And then I stood up in the audience and said, you do not love this woman as she deserves to be loved. I love her. And she will come away with me. And we will spend the rest. It was like right out of the movie, The Graduate. Really, it was very inspired by The Graduate, this dream. And I went and I swept up in my arms <laughs> and we we walked majestically out of church i mean you know we're both in our 60s when i had this dream so when i woke up i realized hmm <laughs> perhaps i have ambival ambivalent feelings about getting married <laughs> Did she finally stay married to that guy? She still is married to him. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Sure, it's so funny and a little bit sad that she never, she never decided to just take that. Well. <clears throat> she did. She must have. Had. What? Had, had a little bit of a lesbian relationship. Just to well, see okay. I, I nobody don't know if this is okay. Uh, if you remove her name, nobody will know anyhow. No, my, my close friend had a very, very traumatic childhood. Uh, with a lot of sexual abuse, and her father was an embezzler, and her mother was and deserted the family, and her mother was an alcoholic, and she had a very intense need to live within the borders of conventional life, because that's what she said to me later, she said, yes, I can easily imagine having a great sexual relationship with a woman, but I cannot imagine violating uh, the rules of society and living. That would make me too uncomfortable. So, and that made sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. I mean, I, really. I mean, I grew up, I was totally within the box the way I grew up. There wasn't anything, but she had somebody who has all these feelings of of worrying about, they're living this supposedly middle class life, but they don't have any food and, you know, and her father left and it was just really, it was very difficult. Very difficult. So that's why she's not a lesbian. Yeah. Yeah, she found else. <laughs> yes, she found someone who really appreciates her. Yes, because that when I woke up from the dream, I said, "Okay, so I was me in the dream, and was, but the groom wasn't, because really does love very much." So. <clears throat> Okay, so fast forwarding kind of to your to your now mid twenties, you, you started this theater company, but then you moved to San Francisco. Yeah, and this was the period of my celibacy. Okay, start so start with like something like you know so. Okay, so I kind of in I guess in my mid twenties or yeah my mid twenties, I stopped falling in love with men. My impression was that men were not interested in me because I was a feminist 
and so outspoken. But in fact, something mutual was going on <laughs> between me and Ben. We were drifting apart. And uh, <clears throat> so, whereas for it, previously, it seemed to me that uh, I could, if I slept with somebody, I wanted to fall in love with them. Now it became something that I could always keep my emotional distance. I just didn't care that much about men. That's what was really happening was I was losing interest. Uh, I'm really uh, an intimacy junkie. And one of the reasons that I'm a lesbian is that I've been able to be much more intimate with women than I ever was with men. So there was really a long time of me being uh, Well, certainly not having sex very much. I was, especially because in Isla Vista, that was really, that was a time, you know, in the party and then the party went on and then people would take off their clothes and there would be kind of an orgy and, you know, and, and the whole thing was, <laughs> there was, there was kind of a tradition that the orgy didn't start until after I left. <laughs> Partly because everybody had cats and I was allergic to cats, so I could never stay that late. But also, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't doing it. It just didn't grab me. And then if it did grab me and then, you know, I got involved with somebody and he said, you know, oh, well, I have to leave. Like this one guy, we got together right before we were graduating. He was all upset that we were graduating, going different places. I wasn't. So... That was, and then, you know, then I moved to, I, I moved to Santa Cruz to help start a theater there with friends from Antioch, who'd been in the theater district, theater program in Antioch. And <clears throat> I was the only woman in the group. And they were very, very nice men, but still it was horrible being the only woman. And they really just thought I was a pain in the ass. And I felt like, what I am saying to you is a woman's viewpoint and you should give me some credit credit for that and listen to me rather than just saying I'm I'm always the only the one that always disagrees with everybody. But during that time, I remember that uh, these three men came to stay at our our house. They were, were going to be doing a play with us or or we were they were going to be on the same bill as us doing their own thing. And this one guy and I start, and these all these guys are sleeping in the living room. And this one guy and I start having an affair. And so he moves into my bedroom. And he was a poet. And he wrote this beautiful love poem on the back of my food stamp application. And <clears throat> I just filled out the food stamp application and turned to him. <laughs> and he said, you just, I mean, he had written this poem. He said, you just. You just turned in my poem with the food stamp application. I said, well, yeah, I need the food stamps. I think that was pre-lesbian behavior, frankly. You know, then I got tired of him and he went back to the living room. <laughs> that was kind of how it was. And, and there was a couple times in there where I had some kind of intense contact with a woman in a dance, you know. And Carolyn, who is my crony, my uh, collaborator, and, and uh, we've been doing theater together since 2008, but back to 1972, she's one of those people who came to the first meeting of the, of the Isla Vista Community Theater. In working on this feminist theater, she and I did an improvisation where we were two roommates talking about uh, she was talking about she was attracted to me. Well, there, nobody, people still talk about that improvisation. Everybody remembers that improvisation. Uh, so. Wait, why does everyone remember that? Improvisation? Because it was so fraught with actual t real tension between us. Because we have, we do have this incredible connection, you know. And Carolyn has had lesbian relationships. She had lesbian relationships before me. But um, 
So it was a real thing happening in front of people. You know, it wasn't just an improvisation. And, but funnily enough, we never did it as part of the feminist theater. It was like, mm, we're not going to go there again, you know? And then. Leo, for, Leo, for a second, sorry. I wanted to do one thing. I just want to check the frame real quick. Just to see this. And if you could just look as if I were sitting in that chair still. Okay. Well, I just wonder if there was enough sort of contrast between the two that kind of kind of makes sense. And then if you don't mind pausing for a second, I just need a glass of water. Okay, so after two years. Just hold on a second. Okay. Make sure we're all set. All right. Uh, So I, I, it took me two years to get my master's, and then I moved to uh, Santa, Santa Cruz to start this, uh, start the Bay Republic Theater with these friends from Antioch College, the theater department, and it was all men. I was the only women, woman, and it was horrible because I was the only woman. They were doing a play that I felt was very sexist. And I had to play this very, and the director who was not one of these, my friends, um, I felt was sexist. And, uh, and I just, I came, then my friends came up from Isla Vista, my women friends, they came up for the very first women's music festival the first one that ever happened, in the Redwoods, in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And so we all went to this amazing festival. It wasn't huge. I think there was like 200 people there. The music was incredible, absolutely amazing. And we're in this sort of clubhouse, camping out, you know, and then there's a clubhouse and a stage outside and all that. And, uh, and we're all naked all the time, mostly, and we dropped acid. And then <clears throat> it turned out this place where we were having this festival was a, a motorcycle club. So at some point, oh, <laughs> these guys on big Harleys come to, they didn't know that there was a women's music festival there, you know? So they, that's been rented out to, you know, all these dykes. So, of course, I wasn't a dyke then. I, none of us were dykes, I don't think. At least we weren't out in my group. So they come up and they're motorcycles and they want to come in. They want to disrupt the whole thing. And I was uh, tripping on acid and I felt that we should kill them. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Or if I said, I said it, but, you know, definitely wasn't what was, I was not in charge and that was not going to happen. Uh, but I had this amazing desire to kill them. And I, from that experience, I had a desire to write a play about the rage women feel against men. And I knew I was going to start a women's theater. From this experience of just working with men, only men, and then having this experience while well, I was trippy, at uh, this women's music festival, I knew I was going to start a women's theater. So I left Santa Cruz and I moved to Berkeley and I started Lilith Feminist Theater or Lilith, a women's theater collective. We had different versions of our name. Lilith was Adam's first wife and she was made equally with him from dust. So when he demanded that she lie beneath him, he, uh, she said, why should I? We're equal. So uh, then she, in a rage, she left Eden, and then she becomes a demon. She is the major evil demon in Jewish folk mythology. But to me, she was a symbol. As a Jew, I felt she was my link to this primordial female strength and rage. So was Lilith only in the because I you know I grew up going to Sunday school and hearing about you know Adam and Eve. Is she only in like the 
Uh, no, no, she's been cut out. She's in the uh, some. You, but you can see because you you look and you see where she's cut out because it's a, it says male and female created he them from dust and then all of a sudden the Adam's alone. So you see the evidence of the fir- creation of the first woman, which was Lilith. She was cut out, but this so then and she's in the Babylonian tales or what I you know I don't really remember the exact thing, but the evidence of her is there in King James version of the Bible. You can go and read that. Male and female created he them from dust. And then all of a sudden he's alone again. So. Uh, then the next version is he took a rib for her. Yeah, because that was to make sure that she was subservient. That she, So let's make uh, this woman from part of Adam's body. Then we won't have this problem. So I started Lilith. I still was not a lesbian. I was still in my, quote, celibate, unquote, phase. And for the very first uh, show, we had all these scenes based on our personal experiences, and we all had a personal monologue. And mine was, I'm becoming the man I wanted to marry. It was all about that I wasn't uh, sleeping with men anymore. It just wasn't happening. But yet I was coming into my own. And I was realizing that I could, um, all the things that I looked for in a man, I could be myself, you know, in fact, was myself, those things. So I was in a certain way releasing myself. Uh, And there was all, as I said, there was all kinds of obvious traces that, I was going towards lesbianism, but just wasn't willing to acknowledge it. It's really clear in that monologue, you know, because I I make up these lies. I really I didn't know I was lying. Uh, you know, I say I say it. You know, I one in my monologue I say, well, maybe I should just be a lesbian and then I'll have sex. But after a lot of talk with my friends, I've realized that I'm not a lesbian. I'm bisexual, a bisexual celibate. Well, I never talked with my friends about that. Never. Because my friends would have never said Because when I did come out, everybody said, well, we were wondering how long it would take you to figure it out. <laughs> That's what people's response was. And I finally, when I told my ex-boyfriend, he said, I'm shocked. I said, thank goodness, somebody's shocked at last. <laughs> Do you think, like, looking back, I mean, do you have any sense of why it was important to you to kind of take that long? Like, I'm just curious if... No, I wish it... I wish... I so wish I... That's a good question. Why did it take me so long? Well, as I said, my sexual urges came late, like not in high school. I had no, really no sexual feeling. Um, It didn't exist as a possibility, really. And the images that I had, like I remember my first boyfriend had this, um, it made a huge impression on me, this pornographic book that I read. And it was this woman who would uh, do anything. You know, she became more and more and more depraved sexually, okay? And was going down and down and down. And then finally, finally, she became a lesbian. I mean, that was the bottom. And I took that as at face value, really. I had no question that that was the bottom. It was the bottom. Everybody knew that. If you even knew of the existence of lesbians, you know? And so it was such a terrible thing to be. I accepted that. So it certainly, I, I was a good girl. I was such a good girl. I was always a good girl. 
I just became less and less of a good girl as time went on. And certainly I thought of myself as a good girl all the time. I was, you know, having sex with men and, you know, going on whatever demonstrations or, you know, long after my mother thought of me as a good girl. So I don't know. It really, I see, the truth is I blame the lesbians because I, nobody tried to seduce me. And so I blame all the lesbians who didn't seduce me because I was there. I was available. I was celibate, you know. I had no feeling for men anymore. You know, sleep with them, not sleep with them, whatever. Bye-bye. But nobody tried to seduce me. So I had to start, the truth was, I had to start a feminist theater and had to run it for, be in it for two years before finally there were lesbians in it. And then one of them was tried to seduce me. Try. I mean, it was definitely, I was there, you know, immediately. So, yeah. So we had, it was very interesting because it started uh, my understanding that of, that it was there. We were doing improvisations again, and this was at a date. This was that we were working on a play on women in work, moonlighting. It's really it was a wonderful play, and uh, I mean, this was at a time it was seventy six or something where the idea of women in work was like, oh wow, women they work. <laughs> Because, I mean, they, women were already working, but it was not anything that was ever talked about. So it was sort of a radical thing to do this show on women and work. And so this, we were doing this one thing. It was about a scene in a daycare center. It was actually about, it was all based on our, mostly based on our personal experiences. This woman had a hit a child. She got so frustrated. That's what was the scene was about. And so... Uh, <clears throat> Several of us were just big kids in the daycare center, just kind of background people. And so Sherry and I, we started wrestling. And we just never stopped wrestling. And it was this incredibly uh, erotic thing to me. We were babies wrestling. But that essentially was my coming out. I mean, that was the end of being... Uh, a straight woman. And then uh, when we had a photo session, uh, people said, uh, oh, Terry and Sherry, do your baby act again. <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> and, they, and so we actually have a photograph. We have all these photos of us wrestling before we ever had sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a photo somewhere of us wrestling, you know. We just got into it, you know, and they're snapping away. And um, so that was really it. She was a lesbian. Uh, she, in fact, was somebody who always fell in love with straight women. So I pretty much, she had a track record that the women would go, you know, decide they weren't lesbians. I think I might be the only one who she, you know, converted. Um, so that was just it that, and then when I first, um, the, we were going to a conference on, it was violence, women and violence. So was this a 76 conference? Yeah. 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 In San Francisco. Yeah. yeah okay. So I had this, and she and I were going. Were we there, just for historical purposes. Okay, there was 1976. There was a conference on vi women and violence. It was a very big deal in San Francisco, and Sherry and I were the only people from the theater who were going. And I felt very strongly that something was going to happen that night, and <clears throat> so this woman who gave. Uh, the keynote speech, uh, Margaret Sloan Hunter, I think, she went on this rampage about heterosexual women and how they should be labeled like cigarette packs. She obviously had had uh, a bad experience with a heterosexual woman, and it was very inappropriate for the keynote speech on a 
uh, in the Conference on Women and Violence. And so, and I remember thinking, I think this is my last day as a heterosexual woman. So this is my last day to stand up for heterosexual women. So I stood up and, you know, you know, challenged everything she said about heterosexual women. But it was, I had this understanding, you know, that, that it was coming to an end that night. So then we went to, of course, the conference was downtown and we, Sherry took me to the top of the mark, which is a good place to take somebody when you want to seduce them. And she said, how does it make you feel that I'm a lesbian? Now, it turned out, even though she was somebody who had known she was a lesbian since she was, as she said, two years old, she had never said the words, I'm a lesbian before. That's what she told me later. And I said, it makes me want to sleep with you. So, and that was really, but I was 30. It was a week after my 30th birthday. That was really it for me. It was just very clear. Even though the very first night we didn't actually really have sex because I was very freaked out on some level, you know, I did not want, I did not want her to touch my genitals. I just wanted her to hold me because I knew it was, I was entering, it was a big deal to me. Um, and in fact, I got very depressed for the first time in my life because I knew I was leaving this safe structure of belonging and and I was really scared to do it. I, I don't know, scared, but I was depressed. At the same time, I was in love and everything was wonderful. I also had this depression because I was leaving the straight world and all the safety and the, the freedom to uh, walk down the street hand in hand with, you know, with your arms around your love and things like that. I I just uh, found it very difficult that that was over for me. But it was very clear immediately. I'm a lesbian, that's that. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's great. The whole thing is a great story. It's very moving. Did you ever write that, that scene, the scene of you looking at her at the top of the mark? No, I don't think I ever did. Yeah. Yeah. It was... Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, or anything of you, of the period of depression that followed? That you never kind of turned out again? No, real, not really. I wasn't at that point. No, we were, no. Yeah. I mean, I was working really hard with Lilith, and we were still sort of, uh, like, in this play on women and work, I we didn't have anything about lesbians in it. We really didn't. So did that feel like you're in the women's movement, you're clearly identified as a feminist, you formed the Women's Theater Company, but to actually start doing lesbian content and lesbian material, did that feel like a whole yeah. other bridge? Yes, and we were working with, uh, we weren't all lesbians. So let me tell you, at that time, when you start talking about doing a scene with lesbians in it, the heterosexual women don't want it. They are not interested, even if they're not in the scene, they don't want the group going there. And since we had a collective and everybody had the veto power, so we couldn't do it. So even when we, uh, the next scene we wrote, Sacrifices did have explicit lesbians in it. But it was a battle and it was, believe me, there was no physical nothing going on at all, you know, because... A, the straight women didn't want it at all. They didn't want anybody to be identified as a lesbian. So, yeah, to do actual... So then, after that, because after that, we went to um, uh, Europe. We toured Europe with the play on women and work and also um, a play manifesto uh, that did have Oh, did that have a lesbian relationship in it? Maybe not, but we had, that had a lesbian feeling because we had, it was, um, there were men 
there were it was all women and sometimes they were playing a sex a sexual romantic scene with the another woman so that was and i remember there was this is a terrible story uh <clears throat> we were rehearsing at bethany church and i knew that um so marga gomez was the lead she was very young and um she really wasn't i mean she's a wonder i oh you might not even know marga gomez she's very well known in the bay area she's an incredible stand-up comedian and she has solo shows she's really incredible but this was this was really too and she's very beautiful too so anyhow this was uh this play manifesto i cast her in the main part and the truth was it was a bit much for her it was too much she wasn't ready for it she was very she's like 21 or 22 and then um and it was all about this italian woman and michelle who was italian she felt that she should have had the part and i always whenever i go to a play and i see a beautiful woman cast in a uh a part that she can't do i think oh yeah the director had the hots for her and and essentially that's what happened with me and marga i just had this huge crush on her so i gave her the main part <laughs> so i was very embarrassed that i did when i looked back that i did this thing so anyhow i knew that uh marga and um michelle were attracted to each other so we had this whole rehearsal in and marga was an out lesbian but michelle not we had this whole rehearsal, and Michelle was one of the, had one of the characters of the, I think she was the young man who first, uh, the, you know, the, the character, the main character is a prostitute, young, very young, a prostitute, and this young man is her first customer, and they actually, you know, have great sex and fall in love. Anyhow, so I was rehearsing with the two of them in the chapel of the church and <clears throat> and i knew that they were uh, possibly on the verge of getting involved with each other so <laughs> you know so you know i had them you know caressing no 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 you have to do it again go slower no even slower <laughs> it's just i was totally sadistic <laughs> and then you know they slept together that night <laughs> after that rehearsal so then um lilith I'm, gonna, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. I, just, there's a little piece I wanted to pick up on which was uh, it's a little bit theoretical but it strikes me that the battle going on within your collective mm -hmm. kind of mirrored the women's movement as as, as, as yes. large so maybe i mean i know that's my idea you didn't come up with it it, just, it sounds like it makes sense to you already. oh it definitely makes sense and oh i forgot to tell you this would happen when i was still in new york and it also was one of the reasons why I had such bad, weird feelings about lesbians. Okay, the very famous conference, women's conference in New York that was disrupted by Rita Mae Brown, okay, and this whole lesbian cohort. So it was supposed, I don't know what this women's conference was about, was supposed to be about, but it was immediately disrupted by these, um, these dykes and who were demanding to be acknowledged as part an important part of the women's movement and it was really incredible and shocking and the whole agenda was thrown out and it was just all people getting together and talking about this issue so <clears throat> at one point uh so i was in this group and people were talking about this issue and i said uh, i don't want to be a lesbian i can't imagine being a lesbian because i'm afraid my i'm afraid of what my mother would think of me and this woman came up to me afterwards she was a lesbian she came up to me afterwards and she said you're not worried about what your mother will think of you you're worried about what you will think of yourself and she was like this butch motorcycle dyke she was a member of the jewish defense league do you, you you remember okay i mean these people were like right wing macho jews this was a motorcycle dyke who was a right wing macho jew <laughs> this has to be the first out lesbian that i meet is a complete weirdo so 
And then she took me, so I thought she was going to seduce me. I was, you know, even though she was a complete weirdo and, you know, very, I was ready. But, you know, she dropped me off. She, we rode around on her motorcycle. I think we went out to dinner and she dropped me off. You know, she was not interested in me. And, uh, and then I went to the dance, the women's dance that night. So I was terrified, you know. So this young woman much younger, much smaller than me, comes, you know, asks me to dance. And we're like, it was a slow dance. And we're just dancing, completely terrified. There is no, we're both terrified. There is no physical feeling between us at all. We're dancing, slow dance, staying as far apart from each other as we can. And then I left, okay? Then I get involved in a consciousness raising group. And there was one lesbian in the group and again she turns out to be a total weirdo she wore turbans i mean she dressed in very femmy clothes with she was like a person from the 60s and 50s or something like that and bright red lipstick and she wore a turban but this this is another reason probably why i didn't want to be a lesbian for one thing she was weird okay she's absolutely the weirdest person in the group strange so then she's gone for a few months. She comes back. What happened? Well, what happened? I'm telling you, this is in New York City. Uh, a man, her neighbor, attacked her on the stairs of, you know, her apartment building. And she threw him down the stairs. So he went to report, you know, to report to the police that she had attacked him. And I mean, he was trying, he was trying to rape her. Okay. She threw him down the stairs. So then they call her in <clears throat> and she says, you know, he was attacking me. That's why I threw him down the stairs. And then he says, uh, no, I couldn't have been attacking her because she's a lesbian. And she they went to try. She went to trial and she went to prison for three months because a lesbian does not have the same right to self defense as you know. He said she threw me down the stairs because she's a lesbian and she hates men. I it is impossible that I tried to rape her because she's a lesbian and. Obviously, she hates all men, and that's why she threw me down the stairs. So she went to prison. That's why she was gone from the consciousness raising group for three months. So let me tell you, that made me much less interested in being a lesbian, too. You know, she went to prison because she was a lesbian. Wow. Yeah. Um, so a lot of um, all these stories are great. First, that you know your great stories are. In case no one's ever told. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, let me check the time real quick. Okay, we're good. I want to, um, so, by the time you've, let's, let's kind of, you've come out, you're yeah. 30, you're into your 30s, yeah. you've come out, um, you're writing the book Lilith. One of the reasons, I guess we'll go back, how did you, maybe kind of moving into your 30s now, as you were writing this theory, and as you were getting more comfortable as a lesbian, were you part of, or how did you relate to the women who were really sort of ardent separatists? I was never a separatist. I always had good friends who were gay men. And I also, a couple of friends who were heterosexual men. I never felt that need to be separate. I understood it. And I respected it. And I certainly feel that sisterhood is a real thing. And it, it's a great, very powerful. And, and it was there when I started a women's theater. That power was there. Um, I... That was not something I uh, 
I was, it, our, our performances were open to men. Um, so I just, it was something that I had a lot of empathy with, I would say, but it wasn't um, something that I felt within myself at all. Okay. Ever, really. Okay. Yeah, I just wondered. Yeah. I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm still just very curious. Oh my gosh, you know, I have a lesbian ethics. Do you know about, the, there was a, uh, there, oh, there was a journal, Lesbian Ethics. I have a lot of copies of it. If you, <clears throat> were interested. I started reading, I just picked it up recently, started reading this one, and it was very much, they were very much separatists, okay? So there's a lot of material about separatism. Um, but this one journal was also about, and I never knew about this, when women, usually with their lover, would I, what would, I think they called it disappearing, that they would just, it was kind of a, a sacred, weird thing to do. I never knew about it until I read about it on lesbian ethics. They would just leave. They would be part of a community. They would just leave without telling anybody and move 2,000 miles away and be in a new community. And this was somehow some rite of passage to just break without any notice I mean, it was very, very painful. I felt so much pain in these women, you know, in what they were doing. And I was very shocked by what I read in that. It was disturbing. I didn't know anything about it until just recently, a couple months ago, I read it. And this was something more like not necessarily from the present, but things, this was a part of that kind of, yeah. at that time. Yeah, I think so. Like, I'm not quite sure yeah. how long ago that was, but okay. yeah. So that okay. it wasn't me. It wasn't you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me take one question for you. Um, um, in terms of the, because I've I read as much as I could, including on the Royal Society, but the different plays that you've written, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of them. And so I was kind of trying to figure out how can we talk about your body of work without necessarily going yeah. play by play. So one way it occurred to me was um, to ask you, as you look back, um, at some of the plays that you've created and toured and, and the lives of these plays have been on, which, what are a few of them that really stand out for you for one reason or another? Well, of course, Dos Lesbos was the leap into writing about being a lesbian what it means, what the relationship's like, what, what you face in the world, you know. <clears throat> and um, so, and that was written uh, based on, with uh, there was a group of us. I did almost all the writing. Carolyn Myers, who was my longtime collaborator, was the other writer. Very much, I was writing a lot of what went along went on between me and Alice Thompson, who was my lover at the time, who just was an incredibly brilliant, creative person. But she didn't write any of it, but uh, she lived a lot of it. And so that was incredibly exciting because we were holding up a mirror to the community that it had not seen before because the images of lesbians were of evil vampires, really, or poor, pathetic women who committed suicide. There wasn't anything out there that we could really relate to. So it was so incredibly exciting to, to be representing a community to itself. And we would... Uh, you know, meet people on the streets and they would say, like people would get really angry at us. Why didn't you do a scene about such and such? You know, because, and I always took it as a compliment, their anger, that they felt that we were so much representing them that we should really represent this particular thing that they experienced, you know? And... Um, do you remember just off the top of your head, 
like an example or two of a thing that a person said? Yeah, I'm trying to remember now what they said. Um, you know, there was nothing about children in it at all. None of us had children at that point, and uh, you know, we weren't interested, and in, we so so that was one thing. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. yeah. <clears throat> so really, really, just incredibly groundbreaking. It was, and when uh, Kate McDermott, who lived in Santa Cruz, saw a production in Santa Cruz, uh, she said there must. She thought, "Wow, there must be other lesbian plays around." And she went to all the bookstores and libraries, and there weren't. And she decided to edit the first anthology of plays by lesbians. So that was inspired by Dos Lesbos. Dos Lesbos, and I think everybody involved with Dos Lesbos was very proud of it. Now, okay, see, not a separatist. The lyricist was a man. The music director was a straight woman. Uh, Carolyn is a straight woman, you know? So, in fact... Alice and I were the lesbians, but it, I don't know, that that was okay. It was okay. Like, I recently submitted something to this anthology, Dispatches, um, uh, from Lesbian America. It just got published, and when I, when I uh, submitted it, I included the lyrics to this song, you know, that, and they said, no, uh, we only have, are having women in this anthology, so I just sort of redo the scene and leave out the song because the lyrics were by David, who is my lyricist, has been my lyricist since Dos Lesbos. And we were all in Isla Vista together doing theater. So it's continued since 1972. So, um, so it, was, um, it was a very wonderful feeling. And uh, it was also... A wonderful feeling when Lilith, when we toured Europe and toured the Northwest in 1977, toured uh, Europe in 1979, uh, in terms of feminism, it was, we were the first ones that people were seeing. It was very, very special. And I have to say, Carolyn and I, again, had that wonderful feeling when we toured Mexico last year with the Crackpot Crones, which is very feminist and lesbian. And we had one performance at this mind-blowing women's center in Mexico City. These gorgeous young dykes there. And all of them afterwards, they said, please, we need more. We need you down here. We need you. Oh, what a wonderful thing to feel needed. Needed as an artist. That's something. That's something. Then my play, Immediate Family. Well, I would say Immediate Family kind of got around to the lesbian part indirectly. I um, Was I still with Alice? I was still with Alice. Yes. And uh, my dog, I had to have my dog euthanized. She had cancer. And I thought, and then, then at the same time, there were these stories in the paper about this nurse who was killing patients in a nursing home. She was called Death's Angel. So, and I thought, wow, I was able to do this thing which seemed very compassionate and humane for my animal companion, and I couldn't do it for Alice, and Alice couldn't do it for me. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to write a play uh, about uh, this nurse who does it, you know, and um, that she has compassion. That's why she does it in the nursing home. That's how I started out. It's called Death's Angel. And then, of course, if you're doing a play, if an action is being taken, it's more po most powerful if it's the first time it's happening in this play rather than it's something repeated from the past. So I thought, okay, so this nurse is, is um, taking this person off a ventilator. She's never done it before. Why? Why is she doing it this time? 
it's because this person is a lesbian and their lesbian partner has no right to have over her medical decisions. That's why she's doing it. And then I thought, get the nurse out of the way and just have the two women there, the two lesbians there. So this is this play, Immediate Family, which I, uh, it, I changed the name from Death's Angel to Immediate Family. Um, and I, it opened at the first uh, women's theater festival, National Theater Festival in Santa Cruz in 1983. That was when I did it. And that was published in the anthology of lesbian plays. And that what has been uh, performed, it's been translated into different languages and performed all over the world. And for many, uh, many times for a political reason. And um, it was produced in Boise, Idaho and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, when there were anti-gay initiatives on the ballot. And it was a way to raise money and also to raise consciousness about these issues. So I'm very, very proud of that, that my play was used in actual political campaigns. That's, that's important to me. Um, okay. Partly just based on like they seem like a huge milestone. Um, well, I love. Oh, we definitely have to talk about ego. Oh yeah. But I also love. I'm getting my shit together. Oh, together. ego trip, or I'm getting my shit together and dumping it all on you. Yeah. <laughs> the, the title alone. Yeah. Well, there was a there was a um, a famous play. I'm getting my act together and taking it on the road. So this was a take off on that. And it was like the end of the world that I was using the word shit in the title. Let me tell you, the Chronicle wouldn't publish it. And, you know, know, it's funny looking back on it. So uh, this was my first solo play, and it was kind of an economic choice. How can I make money, you know? Let's start start with the title so that we... Okay, Ego Trip. Uh, I that was my first solo play. It was before Immediate Family. It was called Ego Trip, or I'm getting my shit together and dumping it all on you. And it was a conglomeration of a lot of different uh, scenes about my life or characters that I've met, but definitely uh, one of the scenes was about a lot about these coming out or uh, or encounters with lesbians before I came out. Uh, there's a scene about that. So there's a scene about me coming out and it has it has the whole thing about being in the uh, going to that conference in the um, lavender menace. That's what they were called. The lavender menace. Yeah. The lavender menace taking over and all that. And there was also a scene uh, about women's rage. It was called the 5,000-year-old virgin. So that, in some ways, was a takeoff on uh, Rob Reiner's and Mel Brooks' uh, 2,000-year-old man. So the 5,000-year-old virgin is looking for her sister who has gotten her sister. The the 5,000-year-old virgin has been trying to protect her sister from all these men for 5,000 years. You know, so she talks about uh, when the men discovered that women gave birth. It's a kind of a very uh, really angry sort of mythological take on history. It's a very harsh, angry piece. Um, so that was my very first solo show and when you wrote these like imagine that 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 piece for example the five thousand year old virgin and, and the anger that went into it like <clears throat> i'm curious as to how you would feel when you were writing scenes like that would they come from a place of you feeling and carrying around a lot of 
sort of unmetabolized anger? I think, yes, I do. All women do. I'm certain of it. And I am only now finally writing the play about it. Now I am writing it. It was the reason that I started Lilith in 1974 when I wanted to kill those motorcycle jerks who were trying to bust up our festival. I wanted to write that play about women's rage. I have discovered that there is so little tolerance of the exploration of women's rage, even by lesbian separatists, would they, you actually see it on stage, would you actually see women on stage talking about how horrible men can be. There is almost no tolerance of it from anybody. That's what we have discovered. When we did the show on women and work in Lilith, Carolyn did a scene about, she had been a firefighter in, uh, <clears throat> in the National Forest. And she did a scene about this really sort of uh, hostile, uh, aggressive, uh, woman-hating supervisor that she'd had. And it, was, it went back and forth between what was going on between him and her. And then we would do her fantasies of what she wanted to do to him. Well, we made the this, this scene of what he was doing milder than the act than the reality people couldn't take it this i mean telling you lesbian feminists saying why do you have that you know stereotypical man hating scene there is no leeway for women to talk about this nobody can handle it anyhow i'm doing it now this is finally my statement uh you should i guess i should tell you about that right just yes. okay um it's called Mikva. Mikva is the name of the. Okay, this is the play I'm working on now, which is the play that I've been meaning to write ever since I started a women's theater in 1974. So it's taken me this long to get to it. This play about women's rage. So Mikva takes place in a women's rich, a Jewish women's ritual bath. That's what a mikveh is. It's a Jewish ritual bath. And all married women must purify themselves in the mikveh after their period, before they can have sex with their husbands again. So every Jewish community has to have a mikveh. That's the first thing they build. They have to have that before anything else. And... This is about a, a lesbian relationship between the mikveh attendant, who is a dyke, and who is kind of a, a golem figure. Golem is sort of the precursor to Frankenstein, sort of a very awkward big person. She's, she's the uh, daughter of the witch, who was like the healer, but also the dicey person, and who was murdered. And then they get the they gave the fifteen year old daughter of the witch the job of mikveh attendant, and then in comes Rachel, the beautiful young woman who uh, has been brought up by her father, who cherished her and adored her and educated her far beyond any other women, and now she's marrying this rich man, and everybody's very happy. And then it turns out that this man is horrible, and so she becomes more and more attached to Chava, the mikveh attendant, and they fall in love. And Rachel is, Rachel expresses that rage. Rachel is pissed off because she was brought up by this very loving father who encouraged her to really be herself, and now he doesn't give a shit that she is suffering in this marriage because he gets to sit on the Eastern bench in the synagogue because he's the father-in-law of a rich man and he gets to have chicken every Shabbat at the rich man's table and he's not interested in what his daughter's going through anymore. And she's pissed off. And uh, so, and they have this incredible sexual relationship and uh, 
then it turns out that one of the beggars uh, spies. Uh, the reason they're not being turned in by anybody is that, in fact, Havas had uh, affairs with several of the women in the village, including the wife of the rabbi, who's the person who really runs the village. So, so nothing's going to happen, be said, because the wife of the rabbi doesn't want anything to be said, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but then this beggar spies them through a knot hole, you know. This is based on a news article about a rabbi who did it in a Hasidic community in upstate New York. So it's like, I didn't get this idea from my head. I got it from the New York Times. Uh, <clears throat> and so he wants to blackmail them. And the what he wants is he wants to have sex with Rachel, or he's going to turn them in. So uh, and Rachel just wants to leave, but Hava won't leave because Hava has known starvation, and the mikvah is her security. So she won't leave. And then Rachel says, "Well, then we have to kill this guy." So anyhow, they kill him, and then uh, later uh, Rachel kills her husband. Then they leave. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it's just a, a very exciting, these characters are just there. You know, the greatest thing when you're writing is when you feel like you're channeling something. You feel like this happened once. I know it. And I'm just telling the story now. And that's so, what I feel. So <clears throat> what do you think has brought you to the point now? <clears throat> Let me pause for one second. Deep. What about these next seven yeah. minutes? Right. Let's pause real quick. We're going to just see, set up, say, you know, yeah. this, this play I'm working on. I'm, okay, this play I'm working on, I always knew, it, well, or it seemed obvious to me as a Jew and a lesbian that a mikvah, a Jewish women's ritual bath, was a sexy environment for women attracted to women, okay? So I've known for a long time that I was going to write a play that took place in a mikvah that was about a lesbian relationship between the mikvah attendant and somebody else. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to understand, since you're asking, why I feel now the courage to express this rage through a character that I have never felt the courage to do, or I've just, I feel like I'm going to go all the way with, with Rachel, because Rachel's going to go all the way. Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I'm wondering if my Buddhist practice has something to do with it. I mean, because Buddhism is about ultimately, well, one of the things, is just being fully who you are. Although uh, my teacher was very... Uh, alarm that I was going to write a scene, a play with violence in it, let alone murder. And, you know, she said, oh, no, no, I don't think so. I don't think this is a good thing. And it was, <laughs> my reaction was, uh, well, and your point is, <laughs> I mean, it's like, so what if you don't think it's a good thing? I mean, that is, you know, if you're an artist and you're on, you, your path is your path, and that's that. And then she talked to her teacher, and her teacher said, oh, look, the artists, they have to go. Exactly, you know. But I think in some way, um, my Buddhism has helped me be stronger or more aware of myself. I think also the fact that I'm working with Carolyn since 2008, that we are finally fulfilling the collaboration that we began in 1972. And there's gives me so much strength, even though Carolyn is a much more devoted Buddhist than me. 
and she is not going to work with me on this play because it is about violence, which I understand. She supports me doing it, but she is not going to work with me on it. Um, and that's totally okay with me. But I think perhaps Buddhism gives me strength and Carolyn, now our collaboration, which is um, certainly the most important relationship in my life. And I think we, we both agree it's a marriage, even though she's is really married to Matthew. And I understand that takes precedence over me, you know, emotionally. Um, we also acknowledge that what we have is a really a, a commitment that uh, we are now fulfilling that is probably is going to go until it can't go anymore basically it's a very deep rich thing that we have and very joyful even though we've had certainly ups and downs and serious conflicts there's a tremendous amount of joy and has been I, I always considered the great tragedy of my life that we had not fulfilled our collaboration. This is before 2008, because she moved to Ashland, which was absolutely the right decision for her because she was raising children and it was much better than San Francisco in so many ways. Um, and we collaborated in some ways along the way, but mostly we were doing theater separately. Um, <clears throat> But then it's so interesting. You have this, you have this idea. Well, we live four hundred miles from each other, and therefore we cannot work together. And then, okay, this is how we started working together. This is a great story. This is the beginning of our collaboration of the Crackpot Crows. So we finally, I find, so we've taken a couple of short vacations, but we've never taken a real vacation together. And finally, I said, okay, we're going to take a real 10 day vacation. And it was, she was teaching, so it was over Christmas. And so uh, I was trying to figure out where we could go. And uh, I had She Wolf's Guide to Women's Land. And, um, and there was a, in uh, Ojo uh, Caliente, which means hot eye, New Mexico, uh, Casa Feminista, which was uh, a, a guest house for women. And it was, Ojo Caliente has, is a, a hot springs spa town. So right next to Casa Feminista was this big spa with all these hot springs. So we said, great. So then I called up to make a reservation. And, and uh, this woman said, yes, this is Sonia Johnson. So I, I said, is this the Sonia Johnson? So Sonia Johnson is this incredible feminist visionary, total separatist. She was a Mormon housewife and mother. So, you know, she really had it very, very heterosexually intense. And she has written books. She ran for president. She's an incredible, amazing person. So we were going to be, she was now running this guest house with her um, wife, Jade. So I was blown away that we were going to be meeting Sonia Johnson. So I said, Carolyn, we're going to be staying with Sonia Johnson. We have to do, we have to perform for them. So we put together this show that we did at, at Casa Feminista. And so the women who were staying there and the women of, of Ojo Caliente came and some women from Albuquerque came and were our friends. And people loved it so much that we just said, oh, we're going to do this for the rest of our lives. I mean, we had all these ideas. We're never going to rent a theater. We're never going to do publicity. You know, we all were, we were both so burnt out by producing. And so for quite a while, we just did it in people's houses. And then finally we said, we're doing all this work. And all we have is this tiny audience in people's houses, for God's sake, you know. Let's do some publicity and rent a theater. <laughs> so, and we just did it. Carolyn was still living in Ashland all the time, but I'd go up there for, 
she'd come down here. We just did it. So this thing that we thought we couldn't do for 30 years, once we changed our minds, we could do it. Now, Carolyn still is gone a lot. You know, she spends a lot of time in Ashland and her daughter lives in Portland and another daughter's in Oaxaca. And, but she also lives upstairs and we work together. So she is uh, in a very um, ambiguous position as a straight woman doing theater, you know, being a lesbian on stage and stuff like that. And she, we tried to figure out what we could do about that because, um, well, for one thing, we wanted to make it clear that she was heterosexual so people would know that she wasn't my girlfriend. So maybe I would have a chance of meeting somebody. Uh, <laughs> but also she was worried that people would get angry when they found out that she wasn't a lesbian. But then if she says she's heterosexual, the people think she's ashamed to be a thought a lesbian. So we just don't say anything. So, so, so that, so I think this both Buddhism and the, the collaboration with Carolyn have given me the strength. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. I mean, look what just happened in last year with the presidential election and all those women, you know, over 50% of white women voted for him. It's just like, it's mind boggling how far we've come in terms of the liberation of some women and how how little distance we've come in terms of so many women, you know? It's just, so maybe, I don't know, maybe the whole thing, I was already working on it before Trump, so I don't, I can't say that Trump has any, is any part of the motivation, but certainly Trump, the thing that happened and the fact that he's, uh, you know, what he does certainly makes it clear to all of us that we have to say our piece <laughs> that it's really important that we stand up and certainly as a woman you, you feel um we're, we're our next project though is not mikvah we're doing a play on uh susan b anthony and elizabeth Cady Stanton, and this is carolyn's idea because she feels that you know we in some ways reflect them, you know, in terms of our collaboration and uh, physically in some ways or whatever. Although I have to say, I from my reading about them, I'm just completely in awe of them. I don't feel like them. I feel what they did was so far beyond anything that I've attempted. But still, I'm very excited about it. And in fact, you know, they get trashed just because it's, uh, I think you get a lot of academic brownie points for, you know, talking about, I, if women are not perfect, they're shit. That's the truth. A woman is not allowed to make a mistake. You know, essentially, Thomas Jefferson is allowed to have slaves and rape them, you know, and still people keep that separate. They understand that still he is, uh, you know, this great philosopher and president and blah, blah, blah. But no, women, you know, anything that women do that Susan B. or Elizabeth C. that falls below the standard of total enlightenment, just, you know, slash and burn. And so I'm reading these books. I mean, they're putting them down. So it just makes me feel like, yeah, I want to do this play about them. How do you, um, like, you're obviously a very funny person who loves to laugh. You're, you're, I'm sure your plays are fused with lots of humor and, and, and yet, and you have this really burning rage inside of you that you're tapping into right in this play. So I just wonder, as an artist, how do you kind of like, how do you keep both of those things working together 
in harmony or not? I don't think they, I'm trying to think. Now, um, I have one play that has a lot of anger, uh, Divide the Living Child, takes place, it's about Christian anti-Semitism. Um, so, uh, it, uh, it's about, I, I lived for five years in Amsterdam. So, um, and I was very interested, I really got into the Holocaust, you know, and writing this play, uh, and researching, researching, researching. Uh, so it's about a, a Jewish woman and her teenage daughter who are being hidden by Christian woman who is trying to convert the daughter to Christianity. So even though this Christian woman is willing to risk her life to save these Jews, she still is anti-Semitic, okay? So that's the situation. And ultimately, the mother realizes she has to leave because the daughter has to be able free. The daughter, the mother's in total hiding. The daughter is going out into the world as the supposedly the niece of this Christian woman whose parents were killed in the bombing of Rotterdam. And it's so cool when you make things up and it turns out they were true. Like I, you know, I thought, well, you know, what, what's the excuse for, uh, um, you know, this girl suddenly appearing, you know? And then I found out, talking to people in Holland, that, oh, yeah, that's what was said about all these Jewish children, you know, that were masquerading as Christians. The parents were killed in the bombing of Rotterdam. Because <laughs> Rotterdam was the only part of Holland that was destroyed uh, by the Nazis. Uh, because they, they surrendered after they destroyed Rotterdam. So, um, so then... Uh, because that's another rage that I feel towards Christianity, absolutely. And um, so the girl is going, Hannah's going out into the world as a Christian and, uh, you know, going to church and school and all that. And she's torn between the two women. And finally, the mother, the Jewish mother realizes, well, I have to let my daughter go so she can survive. And she leaves, even though there isn't a good place to hide for her to hide, she leaves. But um, before that, she has a meltdown and, uh, it, you know, uh, and she, um, because they're having a Seder. Uh, Tori allows them, the Christian woman allows, says, you know, uh, says, they did, the, the first scene they, is the Sabbath and, and uh, the Christian woman says, oh, this is so wonderful. Jesus was a Jew and we're celebrating a Sabbath. But then they have, um, they're having their little secret Passover Seder and Tori's going along with it. And then she just explodes and says, no, I can't have this in my house. Your people killed my savior, you know. And then the girl falls apart. And then, you know, the Christian woman says to the Jewish mother, if you would only, if you would only accept Jesus in your into your heart, you know, then uh, you know everything would be fine. And the Jewish mother explodes and says, "Jesus, uh, uh, the world would have been better if his mother had strangled him in his cradle. Both Jesus and Hitler should have been strangled in their cradles." Um, it's better written than that. I can't quite remember. But anyhow, it is about strangling Jesus and Hitler in their cradles. So that, that's in there. Um, hard to get that play produced. <laughs> but I feel that that's the expression. And there's light moments in it, but it is not the same as the, there's light moments in all my plays, but there's perhaps no comic moments. Maybe there should be, but there are no comic moments in it. And I'm not sure there's going to be comic moments. So I don't know how, I don't think I have figured out yet how to include both of those things in the same piece. But I remember when I was looking at Divide the Living Child and trying to figure out, well, how do I want to change it? I was thinking, what about going? What about comic moments? There's certainly light moments, but 
Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe I got the impression because you tell funny stories that your plays themselves. They are. Most yeah. of them are comedies. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Like the one I'm doing. Are you going to be here? Oh, no. Well, no. This is in June. Uh, uh, this is what I'm uh, rehearsing right now. Awaiting the Podiatrist, which is uh, about... Uh, oh, you know about it. Okay, you read it about... Awaiting the Podiatrist is about um, <clears throat> a middle-aged dyke whose father is in a coma in intensive care, and she, the main characters are her and her mother, and it's very funny. The mother is very funny. Most of the really funny lines my mother actually said. <laughs> Some of them I made up. <laughs> but she could have said it. Oh, definitely, yeah. So it's a life and death situation, literally, and because they're deciding whether they should take dad off, off the ventilator or not. And, um, and yeah, the mother says these hilarious things, and it's a very... It's a, a hilarious, a painfully hilarious, hilariously painful relationship between the mother and the daughter. So, yes, most of my stuff is funny. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing some of those. Yeah. I have, we're going to have to wrap up, but I have four final questions that I ask all my interviews. Okay. Number one, you have a really, really interesting uh, coming out story. So if somebody, based on your own story or not, but if somebody came to you tomorrow, and said, well, I'm thinking about coming out, whatever that, that person, what, like, one or two just pearls of guidance or wisdom would you offer that person? And this is intended to be a little shorter so we can... Yeah, I think you should come out at your own pace. You have no obligation to tell anybody until you're ready. I would say that's important. Uh, you, you shouldn't... It's a very liberating thing, but you have to decide the, your own pace of liberation. Um, for me, being a lesbian was so much more fun than being straight. And I do feel that I was, could not, what the main thing that happened when I came out was I became free. And I do not believe that I could have been free within the structure of heterosexual patriarchy. As long as I was choosing to be part of it, there was a part of me that was imprisoned in it. So um, it was a wonderful freedom. And um, it's been really a lot of fun, both in terms of as an artist and just a person being a lesbian. And don't worry, you can find people of the, if, if you're a woman, you can find women to treat you just as badly as any man you are with. It's okay. You don't have to worry about giving, giving up being a masochist. <laughs> Okay, next question. Um, yes, we're in a new era, a very radically changed era, but what is your, what wakes you up? What, what, do you, what keeps you feeling hopeful when you wake up in the morning? What's your hope for the future? Well, for one thing, I feel nobody knows the future. So one of the reasons people feel pessimistic is they say, oh, it's horrible, everything's going downhill. And I have to say, from studying what happened in World War II, where, quite frankly, it seemed that Hitler was going to win for quite a long time, we don't know the future. That's really important to me. We are creating the future. Nobody knows what it is. And that's the truth. We don't know it, good or bad. Certainly, Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin said all the time they never could have imagined that they would make this much progress. Never. Now, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton could never imagine that they wouldn't achieve women's suffrage in their lifetime, and they didn't, you know? You don't know the future but you have to act with courage because there are young people 
children younger than you and other people coming up and you have to create the world for them. I, I don't have children, but I feel very responsible to children. Absolutely. Whatever mess there is, they didn't create it. So I do feel like my mother really felt like, well, gee, too bad. The world's kind of a mess now, but I'm old and I'm leaving. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I feel sorry for you guys, but I'm, you know, that's not how I feel as a person of 70. Well, I've done my part and too bad. It was fun for me. Now, um, why is it important to you to tell your story? Tell my story to you? Hey, look, I'm really not as famous as I should be. I, I'm not. I've written all these plays. They're really, really good. People love them. And I'm, you never heard of me, right? Am I right? You never heard of me. That's not saying much, but I've never heard of you. You never heard of me. Yeah, you've heard of Judy, Judy Grand, though, right? Oh, no, she was just another referral. Oh, really? You didn't yeah, know Judy Grand either? Oh, okay. All right. So, so you really never heard of anybody. You don't have never heard of Judy Grand. Um, I never heard of Jewel Gomez. Yeah, know, right. Area. Well, Jewel Gomez, that's okay. she's more local, but Judy Gron is certainly national. Um, and a, a pioneer, she's older than Jewel and, and me, and is really an incredible pioneer. Um, but I see that, you know, I feel like I want people to read my plays in the future. I really believe my plays are worth living beyond my life. So anything I can do to increase the possibility that people will be interested in my work, I want to do. Great. That's a great answer. That's not an answer you can really share in quite that way, but I really appreciate that. And I hope from your mouth to God's ears. Yeah. Thank um, you. <laughs> and lastly, then, in terms of Outwards as a, as a project, what do you see as the importance of a project Stories from all over the country. Well, you're collecting stories from people whose stories don't usually get collected because the same damn people get collected all the time. So that, to me, is the importance of it, really. Um, Oops. Oh, Just, the dog. Is that the dogs? Yeah, and all we've got to do is say this bit, and then we can okay. run, run, so. We could close that door okay. so that we just don't have to. So hold that thought. Make sure to close the door. Okay, if you wouldn't mind, just start that same thought with me. exactly what you said, which you're collecting the stories. Right. You're collecting the stories of people like me who aren't well known, who've done incredible things. Uh, I mean, Corky and Lonnie, the other two women that I know you've interviewed, are just very, very special people. So. It's important for people to understand how many of us there are, how many extraordinary people there are, how many activists, because uh, I think people tend to focus on a few figures as leaders. And um, I started the Pat Bond Memorial Old Dyke Award, uh, which is specifically for le lesbians who have not been sufficiently honored for their contributions to the community. Uh, it was specifically not the Phyllis, Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin Award. You know, they were never going to get it. And, and um, because there are so many people who have given their hearts and their energy and their passion and their creativity and their money, so many of us. And that's beautiful. It's just beautiful. It's a beautiful community to be a part of. It's a wonderful thing to be part of the gay community, truly. I, 